Magandang araw mga kababayan. Welcome to TV Ups Science Innovation Series. Today's topic is very important. It's on agriculture, food and nutrition focused on agricultural crops grown on land. I am Giselle Concepcion, your host. I am a professor from the Marine Science Institute researching on marine drugs from the sea. My co-host is Professor Benji Vallejo. He is with the Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology, and he works on biogeography and ecology, and he is the program coordinator of the Science and Technology and Society program of the UP Diliman College of Science. We are honored with very distinguished guests today in our show. Allow me to introduce Dr. Willie Padolina. So Dr. Padolina was a former Erie Deputy Director General for partnerships, focusing on intellectual property for public good. He was DOST former secretary NAST president, where NAST is the National Academy of Science and Technology, former UP Los Baños vice chancellor for academic affairs and professor, and currently the Ched Picari program manager, where Picari is the Philippine California Advanced Research Initiatives of the government. Also with us today is research professor Art Salazar of the Institute of Plant Breeding. He's a chemist by training and he's been focusing on research on corn. So welcome to our show, Dr. Padolina and Dr. Salazar. Thank you. I'll have Benji ask the first question. Okay, the quest questions for our guests, I think, uh, one of the biggest questions for why we are doing research on uh, agriculture is really for food security. So I think our first question for our guest is, how do we improve uh, agriculture productivity so we can attain food security for our country and people? And may I suggest let's start with staple. Yeah, with staple, probably. Well, the number one staple is really rice. So with respect to rice, uh, would like to ask the, our guest whether uh, how, how do we attain food security for rice and is it possible for us to do so? Yes, it is possible for us to achieve food security provided we are able to put in the science and technology that is needed to make our food reserves and food supply adequate for our population. But of course, it has to be coupled with other policies. Food security is a very complex operation. It needs to be uh, supported by a system of policies, governance, and an infrastructure for research and development that is responsive to the needs of, of the country. So at present, Dr. Padolina, I understand we are a net importer of rice. So why is that? Why uh, is it that uh, Vietnam uh, provides us our rice and previously Thailand? We're supposed to have um, fill rice and Erie uh, in the Philippines helping us with our uh, rice supply. Uh, yes, I think there is an explanation to that, and one of the most com more common explanations to why we are still importing rice is uh, our population growth. Uh, we have not managed it well. Second, we have very limited land that we can harvest for rice. The good Lord gave us only 2.9 physical hectares of land, which translated into harvested area is about 3.7 3 to 4 million hectares of land. Thailand has 9 million hectares of harvested land and only 65 million mouths to feed. 
based on our current uh, consumption of rice of about uh, 119 kilos per person per year, every time we add 1 million more mouths to feed, which is half of what we produce in terms of number of babies per year, we have to harvest an additional 50,000 hectares of rice. Where will we get that now? I think the only way to do that without opening new land is to improve our irrigation. And that needs science. That needs people who know how to manage our water resources, people who, are, who know how to engineer our irrigation canals so they will be functional all the time, and also uh, a governance system that will allow the equitable distribution of water. So rice uh, loves water. That's why the irrigation technology is critical. In Vietnam and Thailand, you have the deltas, you have the Mekong Delta, that is a, like a natural uh, uh, terrain for growing uh, rice. So um, what are the new irrigation technologies, uh, Dr. Padolina, that well, we could explore? Irrigation, because it is very dependent on water, is will have to be managed in a precision manner, which means that the delivery of water has to be managed and controlled so that you don't waste anything and you just uh, put enough water that the rice needs. So there are technologies which have been developed but by both Phil Rice and ERI, uh, like what we call alternate wet and drying. That means you don't keep the rice field wet all the time. And there are indicators which you use so that you know when to deliver water. I think that's a good opportunity for our electronics people to put sensors in the field and then that can just activate the irrigation system uh, pump so that it will deliver water at the time it is needed and stop it when there's enough. Also, we need to breed rice varieties that uh, can can require less water. Uh, right now, the existing uh, uh, varieties, on the average, will require 3,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram of rice. That's a little too much, and I think unless we breed varieties that will require less water, that might not be a sustainable uh, arrangement. So. It's just an example of some of the, the science and technologies that we need to introduce in, in addition to policies and management issues that we need to, to address. So I'm aware that uh, in Phil Rice, uh, for several years now, they have been working on uh, uh, genetic variants of our uh, uh, different breeds of rice, and there's the um, Tungra virus resistant uh, rice variety, and there's one on um, salt stress resistance, and also one that would grow in less water. So have any of these varieties already um, been um, grown in a large scale? I think they are available, and uh, albeit in a very limited way, because the other constraint we face in improving productivity in rice is the availability of elite varieties in terms of seeds. We don't have a well-developed seed industry. And so whenever a farmer might want to, to plant a tungro resistant variety, he has to look for the seeds. And if it's not available in his place, then he is just content to plant what he has and it may not be the tungro resistant variety at the time when a tungro infestation is prevalent in his, in, in his area. Both uh, biotic and abiotic stresses need to be addressed. And part of the abiotic stress would be climate change. Uh, the uh, uh, occurrence of uh, very severe climate conditions like very uh, uh, very hot ambient temperatures or uh, too much water can uh, uh, be a stress to the productivity of the rice plant or even flooding 
And so field rice and eri have developed what we call the submarine rice, which can be submerged for 17 days before flowering, and it will revive itself after the flood waters recede. But if it gets submerged while it is flowering, then it dies. You cannot revive it anymore. Uh, hopefully, the, the typhoons will come before flowering and then the floods will, will hit the rice field before flowering. You can revive the plant. It has been tested in many parts of Asia and I think it's available here. We call it submarine rice. There are also rice varieties that are tolerant to uh, dry, dry areas, uh, drought. So again, these are just examples of how science has been applied, especially in breeding elite varieties. So I think uh, what you're saying, Dr. Padalina, is uh, the importance of um, traditional plant breeding, but also uh, one that is based on genetics. So these are the uh, science areas where our youth should try to uh, specialize in. Okay, so that's one main point. The other is that um, uh, we should really have a seed bank uh, that is secure so that we can, um, well, choose among the very, the very many varieties that we have uh, and select the elite ones. And when you say elite, I would imagine that it refers to the nutritive value of uh, the rice, partly. Okay, As aside from its color, its texture, etc. And this brings to mind your other main point, which is that um, it's the population, the overpopulation, that uh, puts a lot of pressure on our uh, food security, including rice. And I think that's a very point, important point because uh, we have to secure our food, including our staple, for our babies and our youth. Food would be the most important determinant of health, including their intelligence and their competitiveness when they grow up. And it's also the most important determinant of disease. If you're not properly fed, you don't have your defenses, then your tendency is to uh, get sick. Or if you don't eat the right food with a good nutrition, then of course you would also get sick. Which brings us to Maybe another strategy that um, uh, UP researchers are taking, and that is perhaps to improve the nutritive value of rice by combining it with another staple crop, which is corn. And here we have the leader of our research team in UP developing what we call our rice white corn blend. So Art, tell us all about it. Yeah, this is one, uh, thank you. Uh, this one exciting uh, uh, developments in terms of uh, coping up with the food needs of the country. No? Uh, we were not importing rice then. <laughs> it's only uh, relatively uh, a new development. But uh, because uh, food was everywhere, no? Uh, the country is basically rain-fed, and uh, crops grow anywhere. Uh, and so in major parts of the country, like uh, in the south, Visayas and Mindanao, where it's basically mountainous, people uh, depend on crops not irrigated, and that's basically corn. That's why you have a lot of corn in Cebu. In Mindanao, you have a lot of uh, corn, because there's, uh, there's not much place to put in the irrigation system. So they survive on corn, and uh, and and being so, they they had to live with it. And one of the nice things about corn is that uh, uh, it's also ch it's cheaper to grow, and also this one where science and technology could come in. If people could only be uh, properly informed of the benefits of eating corn instead of tasty rice, <laughs> where in uh, so-called the, uh, the high glycemic index, it means, uh, of course, uh, getting it digested in, a, in two hours, while when you eat corn, it, 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 sub it subsists in your body for four hours. So your stamina is improved, you, know, you don't eat much because you still feel full, 
And so we are endorsing corn to supplement rice because of the uh, health issue, uh, nutrition issue. You will notice nowadays that many are uh, affected with diabetes <laughs> because of our propensity to eat good taste. It has to be good tasting, you know? And uh, when you have that, then uh, you, you grapple with the issue of possibly the build up your blood sugar. While in corn, it digests slowly. And so even, even data from the Food and Nutrition Research Institute, they made a nation, nationwide survey that the blood sugar of the people from the south is lower than, than from the north. Oh, because they good. eat less, less rice and more of, more of corn. And it's got more fiber. And also, yeah, yeah. Fiber, no? Of course, oh. with the fiber. And also, uh, uh, one, one, one thing also about corn is that uh, uh, in terms of price, we only import about 10% of our rice requirement. That's not much. And that could be easily replaced by corn. And so if only more people will eat corn, then we need not import rice. We could even export rice. Because if, if all the Filipinos on the average will eat 30% uh, rice, 30% uh, corn, then we have enough to spare. And so this is our immediate advocacy while working on the rice. No, uh, Definitely you have to do something about the rice. So I think uh, if we will just pull our resources together, our minds together, uh, we need not be a food-dependent uh, country. We could, we could be food-independent uh, next year, depending on how serious really the government uh, wants it to be. And if, yeah, if all the uh, key stakeholders will uh, will cooperate and uh, and make a reality the hope that we will be a food sufficient nation. I think that's so important to be um, not dependent on other countries for our food supply. What if they also experience uh, yeah. you know a shortage? <laughs> Siempre they will not import to us, no? naman tayo. So we really have to uh, make the investment in uh, agriculture and i'm a firm believer in that now that is the most important area of research in the country so well, you know rice rice is traded only at six percent of the total global population uh, global production that's very thin no, that's very thin no thin margin only six percent oh, oh, is that's okay. why in, two, in 1997, we had the money, but we could not buy rice. It was the El Nino year. Yes, El Nino year. Imagine that. Oh, imagine so, when you had a big tag-tuyot, when you were there, you could eat there. And uh, that 30 million tons can easily be absorbed by China. Yes, oh, China. Lang. And India. So, unless we really hit a certain level of self-sufficiency in rice, maybe not 100, but not, not, definitely not 70 percent, because we are going to be very insecure in terms of staple, uh, notwithstanding our efforts to also introduce corn into our diet. You know. There are countries which deliberately lower their food uh, staples self-sufficiency levels, and they were affected in 2008. They had the money, but they could not buy anything because all the exporting countries withheld their supplies. So anyway, Art, uh, yung, yung rice white corn blend, white corn, hindi siya yellow corn. Alam natin yung yellow corn, ang maganda doon, may vitamin A pa yon, no? Pero bakit white corn ang ginagamit mo? Ano bang variety yan na dinevelop ba yan ng IPD? Uh, kaya white corn... Gawad, affected tayo ng rice culture. Yung kulay. Eh. Yung, puti, yung kulay. Oo, kulay. Kulay ang problema. Pero, uh, oh, oh, nutritionally, oh. clinically, mas maganda talaga ang yellow. Oh, oh. Unfortunately, yung yellow corn na-associate sa, sa feed kasi yun ang mura na masustansya para sa animals. Oh, oh. Pero sa tao, masustansya din yun. Kaya lang, cultural yung problema eh. Kaya kinakailangan talaga yung science, dissemination din. So, mas masustansya yung yellow mas corn, masustansya. definitely. Kami. Mas Kami. matigas. For oh. one thing, mas matigas. Kaya hinahanap din natin yung puti at yung mas 
malambot ang texture, mas malapit ng konti sa rice. Oo. Well, may paraan naman para mapalambot ng konti yun. <laughs> oh, tinry ko na yan eh. <laughs> na Nabanggit niya na yun. Pwedeng, pwede yan. Pag-blend. Ano, accessibility. Uh -oh. So, uh, paano po natin ma, ano yun, yung, para makonvince yung mga tao? Kasi may ibang regions naman na banggit ko kanina, sa Cebu, kumakahin sila ng maraming corn. Yeah, okay. Oo. Oh. Uh -oh. so, paano sa buong Pilipinas, paano natin ma, ano, Yan, uh, nakasama namin dito si Dean uh, Tere Velasco ng uh, College of DEFCOM Development Communications. So, ang ang ano, ang approach nga ay eh, dapat lang makita ng, ng tao na yung mga mayaman, yung mga educated, kumakain ng, ng corn. Ano? Mm -hmm. Dapat kasi makita eh. So, kailangan mm -hmm. ko ganun. Oo. Oh, oh. oh, oh, eh. At saka kami nagsasalita, oh, kumakain din kami ng corn. Oo oh, nga. Kaya pag Mas... makakapunta kayo sa bahay, sinabi oh, oh. namin doon may mais. Oo. Oh, oh. <laughs> kailangan ko may celebrity na magkakain oh, corn. Oh, available kasi... na ba? Yung iyong rice white corn? Uh, oh, ano? Hindi. Blend? Well, uh, merong nagpapa... Na may, kami, doon sa UPLB, available na yun. Pero may private sector din na nagpakita ng interest na uh, interested silang mag-commercialize. So, bibili na siya ng machine and uh, yeah. gagawa na ng mga... Hindi pa po na nabibili sa supermarket? Soon. Wow. We, expect, we expect it by, uh, by before the year ends, so, magiging available How many hectares na ang nakatanim sa white corn? Yan, isa pang issue yan, Nako. no? Kasi sa corn, yung total uh, corn area natin, 2.5 million hectares yan. Hati dyan ang yellow at saka rice, at yellow at saka white. Pero ang yield ng yellow, sir, yung ano, mga may BT corn, yung mga uh, Roundup Ready, kalahati lang, 1.25 million hectares lang. Pero itong sa corn, ito yung ano, 1.25 million. Pero yung yield niya, kumpara sa yellow, about 4, yung white, yung white corn, wala pang 2. So kung madoble mo lang yung, yung yield nun, Bako. Pwede na tayo mag-export ng rice, eh. Ayun. Mag-compensate. <laughs> <laughs> Ay, ano yan, rain-fed. So, we don't even have to install irrigation facility. So, actually, what the government is doing in terms of, and the and, and our partners doing in research, we're preparing for a rice exporting scenario. If we will only accept corn. <laughs> well, that's a good example of not, of, of an unbalanced investment in breeding crops. There is too much money being put in rice and very little in the other crops, including corn. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> we need to look at our investments in this particular area because I think later on we can say that there are other crops that will also give us higher value in terms of returns that we are not even doing anything in terms of breeding. Because most of the money is putting is being placed in rice. So back to rice, tayo. Tuto bang sacred ang rice sa ibang ano uh, communities or provinces na lalo pa sa ano <laughs> Luzon. Mas alam ni Sir. Oh, oh, kasi, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Well, rice is uh, is very much embedded in our culture. That's undeniable. And if you look at all the Asian countries, the only common thread is rice. They have different religions, uh, but India, China, Japan, Korea, uh, and even Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, they eat rice. So the, the common thread is rice, and it's also a political crop. So that really needs to be understood well by those who are framing the policies and those who are trying to manage the change so that the diets will be a, a balance of rice and corn or a mix of rice and corn. So, um, can you explain that? What do you mean by uh, rice being political? Well, uh, it has uh, been a main source of calories of rural folks in, in the areas, in uh, many areas of Asia, because they plant it where they live. And therefore, the distribution issue is, is not really affected very much. It's already there. They harvest it. They can store it. If you harvest it in Palai, and then you just mill what you want, you can store it for a long time. So it has, and then they also use it because they can store it if their daughter gets sick or somebody gets sick, they, they liquefy it. They sell it and it's converted into cash. That's why in some areas, when I was working at Erie, in some very uh, 
challenged adverse soil areas, they could not convince the farmers to stop planting rice because it gave them some sense of security. And also, of course, because it gives them a sense of security if the government policies don't support the uh, production of rice very well, then, as I said, there's a hungry man, is an angry man, <laughs> and that will cause the instability of the political system. So we need to, it's still a main source of calories in many areas of Asia. And as I recall, the Myanmar Burmese people has probably the highest consumption they consume per capita about four sacks of rice. A sack is 50 kilos. So when you say kaban, it is only 44 kilos. 40 kilos. So you have to make sure you're talking about the same thing. They're not interchangeable. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, point out what you said about um, uh, calories being uh, what's important to farmers or um, local communities. Yet we know in nutrition that it's not calories that we're after. We're after um, other macronutrients and micronutrients important to build our bones, our uh, muscles, uh, to feed our brains, etc. So I think it's important for us to mount what we call a nationwide education um, for nutrition, okay, uh, on what is nutritious and healthy for our population. And that might uh, begin with what Dr. Tere Velasco is doing mm -hmm. regarding rice white corn in the study groups in the UP Los Baños community. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay, uh, the group of uh uh, Dr. Tere Velasco is uh, uh, really studying how to effectively come across uh, the message to the to the people the nutritional merits of eating uh, corn or rice corn blend, no? And uh, uh, basically, uh, it will involve a lot of uh, nutrition work. Uh, her her colleague, Dr. Wilma Hortada, is the the the. Uh, uh, the, the the lady from the Institute of Human Nutrition and Food is the one working on that feeding uh, feeding uh, children school children malnourished and even diabetics. No, mm -hmm. so now we have the data through the EIDR that's the uh, UP project, program. emerging interdisciplinary research. We we are we, do, we now have the the data the solid data the the first <laughs> uh, local uh, solid data on the merits of uh, feeding. Uh, malnourished and diabetics with uh, with corn, and and so if we if we could uh, present it in uh, in a very understandable way to the to the people, then they might have uh, a second look at uh, at corn, not anymore as poor man's food, uh, because that was the problem. Eh? How could we uh, remove them from their mind that this is food for the poor and this food for the animals. We have to disabuse uh, uh, that, that thing from the mind of our people. If we could, if we could uh, convince them that this is a nutritious food. Uh, and and uh, only by accepting that could we hope that uh, uh, sooner, not later, <laughs> we could be self-sufficient in, in food. I just have to comment uh, one thing, sir, on what you said about the uh, food security issue of the local rice farmers. We have the same findings in local corn. We found out that most of our uh, uh, compatriots eating uh, white corn are the farmers themselves. It is their insurance against hunger. Right. Because Good. it's not irrigated, <laughs> it's rain-fed, and it's easy to store then uh, they do not sell it, uh, well, because not many people like it anyway, but they keep it for their food security. That's why even though they are poor, they have something to it. And so they will not part with their corn. It's telling us that, again, uh, uh, the beliefs, uh, the values of communities, they really arise from uh, nature. In central Luzon, where you have the, uh, uh, the valley, then rice, evolved as the uh, staple 
Do naman sa mountainous where there's no, um, you know, irrigation, corn. I'd like to dwell a little bit more on corn because, um, again, in nutrition, importante yung, hindi natawag kong go, grow, and glow. Go is for ano, energy, carbohydrates generally. Grow is for protein. Protein is to build uh, your muscles and bones, etc. Uh, and then glow, of course, is lahat na ng mga micronutrients, including vitamins. So this brings me now to the other kind of food or, or um, agricultural products that we need to uh, invest in in our country. Though I said that um, we are focusing on agricultural crops, ang laki ng impact niyan sa ating livestock industry. Particularly, hog industry and poultry industry, ang laki ng epekto ng corn. Okay? Kasi uh, these animals are fed with corn. And that's also the bias, eh. So, humans don't like to eat corn because it's raw and animal food. Yeah. <laughs> so, tapos kakainin rin naman yung, ano, yung manok at yung, ano, yung baboy. So, anyway, um, I think at this point, we have to uh, discuss another uh, technological issue. It's become a socio-political issue. And that is uh, GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. And many of you probably have heard of BT corn, and more recently, BT eggplant or BT talong. So, Art, I'll ask you first about BT corn. Ano ba yung impact niyan sa uh, ating hog and poultry industry? Positive ba? Uh, okay. Uh, yung BT, uh, nagre-refer yan sa bacteria na pagkinain ng corn borer, which is the number one insect pest ng uh, corn sa Pilipinas, ay namamatay yung... Ano, yung yung uh, insekto. Kasi, ibang-iba naman kasi yung uh, gut condition ng tao at saka ng insekto. Tayo, acidic. Yung insekto naman, basic or alkaline. So, yung ganong basic constitution na nagiging dahilan kung bakit pag kinain ng, ng, ano, ng corn borer, patay siya. Pero pag kinain mo ng tao, hindi naman. Ang laking pagkakaiba nun. So, ang nangyari noon, nung na-introduce itong BT, noon kasi yung mga farmer, hindi ba kapag tanim ng corn after corn? Kasi, pag nag-second crop sila, 30 days lang kasi yung life cycle ng corn borer eh, mm. ay pihadong meron uling next generation of borer to eat on the next crop of corn. Kaya ang nangyari, nung nagkaroon ng BT corn, pwedeng magkasunod. So, kumbaga, may second uh, good corn harvest. Kaya, kaya tumaas yung ating, ano, production ng ng corn. So with with more with more corn for the feeds industry, eh di siyempre more hogs and uh, more feeds for the hogs and the poultry industry. So yung supply ng ating hogs at saka ng live ng ating poultry umangat. Oh, so, oh, oh, kasi may may supply na dati ay lagi tayo nag-i-import ano. Tapos market forces, mas no. malaki yung supply, edi Yo, ano, no. oh, oh. bumababa ng konting presyo, mas affordable, mm -hmm. nakaka-provide ng protein, yung uh, tinatawag nating grow nutrients sa ating mga ano, kababayan. So, uh, yung BT Bacillus thuringiensis na yan, ang pagkaalam ko yan e eh, it's a, a ubiquitous uh, soil bacterium. Yan nga ba raw ay ginagamit ding biopesticide? No una, uh -oh. kinulture yan, uh, nilagyan ng medium, katapos ini-spray. Ang tawag mm. ng eh, uh, dipel. Ano? Mm. Uh, so, pinag-aralan yan, ano bang dahilan kung bakit namamatay ang borer pag ini-spray yan? So, yun ang, uh, yun ang true genetic engineering inilagay sa mais. So, pag kinain ng insekto yung mais, namamatay. So, lahat, kumaga, pag, pag in-spray mo kasi ng dipel, hindi mo naman lahat ma malalagyan yun eh. So, pag tumago doon yung borer, eh, di, uh, buhay yung borer. So, yun yung, yun ang kagandahan nitong technology. Yan, yan ang, ito. ano, uh, biotechnology na targeted nga yung, ano, yung gene na ka-incorporate doon sa crop 
Tapos, uh, yung crap pinoproduce nga yun, tinatawag niya toxin yun, no? Nakatarget doon sa gut noong fruit and stem borer. O, kaya lang yung, borer. ano nga, yung, yung information na sinabi sinamin toxin. Oh, oh. Ay, masama yan, toxin oh, oh. yan. Oh, 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 ano? Pero actually, it's oh, a protein oh. na harmful lang naman doon sa borer. Hindi oh, naman, oh. hindi masya toxic sa tao, oh, oh. eh. Oh, oh. In fact, inilagay na nga nila sa sweet corn, eh. Okay. So, ibig sabihin, safe talaga siya. Okay, so, yung BT na yan, ah, uh, Ginagamit din yan, ina-attack din niya yung, ano, yung um, talong, eggplant. Kaya ngayon, merong BT eggplant na dinevelop ang UP Los Baños for our eggplant varieties. Ang pagkaintindi ko, yung mismong gino nang galing sa India. ba diba? Okay. Ngayon, yung eggplant na yan, um, di yan yung veggie natin, no? Totoo ba na that is one of our most important vegetables in the country, affordable by the general population? In fact, the statistics show it is the number, the one. number, number, one. One. number one vegetable. And uh, before BT Talong was introduced, I was told you have to soak the fruit uh, about 64 times in pesticide. Oh, imagine before that. it is harvested. So if you see a shiny, beautiful-looking eggplant that's not BT, it's probably treated a number of times with pesticide. So you're ingesting the pesticide too. Now, which one is safer? Do you have the, the BT eggplant, which does not affect anything in your gut or would you rather have the pesticide treated eggplant so ako naman i look at it uh, statistically ang dami-dami ng mga gmo foods that uh, you know reach the market or our shelves for example uh, every time you eat a corn chip it's almost sure that's a, no uh, bt corn corn mm -hmm. okay Soy then milk. there is soy, soy milk. milk. Nako, all over the world, young soy milk. Tokwa. In the Tokwa, no? So, uh, there, there was a long period when the, when the European countries would, um, well, bar um, GMO soy from, I think, from Latin America. Pero ngayon, tinatanggap na nila yon. And then, there's tomato. So, merong GMO tomato in cans. Di marami tayong mga tomato sauce, tomato products dyan, you can be sure is this ano, yung long shelf life uh, GMO, GMO tomato, di ba? Okay, so when you consider how many cases have been reported of allergies to GMO foods versus those that have not caused allergy, parang maliit na uh, ano lang yun, percentage ang uh, affected by GMOs and it's not really that well documented. So, so maraming so, uh, may tutulong talaga ang science sa pag uh, uh, pagsisecure ng food natin. Ano? Kinakailangan lang talagang uh, maggawa ng investment doon at saka ipaliwanag talaga sa, ta sa tao. Right. Ngayon, ang isa pang kailangan natin ay tao. Mm. Ngayon, ang tao ay, mismo gagawa. <laughs> no, kulang tayo ngayon ng mga scientists at ang enrollment sa agriculture ng mga agricultural schools ay hindi maganda. Karamihan ay pababa. Sa buong, ba sa buong, sa mundo, buong, mundo, buong mundo yan? Sa buong mundo. Sa buong mundo. Uh, sa aking palagay, kasi nga, nagkaroon ng reputasyon ng agriculture na low-tech, dirty, uh, you will back-breaking, tedious uh, farm life. So, even farmers' children are not encouraged to return to the farms anymore. So, our rural population is becoming geriatric, elderly. But, they're not going to last for long. All of us will have to be given the boarding pass. <laughs> and we need to produce food. You cannot produce food without soil. And uh, you have to make sure that there will be people who will manage that because they will not grow spontaneously. 
So I think we also need to campaign for more Filipino youth to take up careers in agriculture. Uh, contrary to what the common uh, understanding is, agriculture is a knowledge-intensive activity. You cannot be successful in farming, and even the uh, common farmer, he has to have a knowledge bank where he knows when to plant, what to plant, when to water, when to harvest, what to observe when you're going through the field, if it is getting infected, or yes, and also what the market is going to do to require. All of that put together is really a lot of knowledge, and people have to be trained to, to, to look at the whole system. So I think the talent deficit in agriculture has to be addressed. And at the rate that we are being ranked in the Global Food Security Index, it's very scary because we moved from 68 to 74 out of 113 countries in four years. From 2012, we will rank 68. 2016, we are now 74. That's a big <laughs> movement, big, big slide. So, uh, and that's the same pool of countries of 113. I don't think we should allow that to move any further down the line uh, and resign ourselves to just importing food. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, Dr. Padolina, I recall that in the 60s and 70s, Upilos Baños was a, a leading center of uh, research in agriculture and we actually trained so many uh, Vietnamese, Thai, <laughs> yes, Malaysians, Chinese. Indonesians, and Chinese, who then became the research leaders in their countries. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what happened in the last 30 years, okay, was a lack of, um, you might say, political will to continue investing in uh, research, principally in developing the um, experts in the, the field of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So now I think uh, is the time to rally the government to make that investment. I know there are many technologies in UP Los Baños that mm -hmm. should reach the market. For example, yung, um, in your research on uh, delayed ripening papaya. Mm -hmm. So ano rin yun, di ba? Uh, GMO din yun. Yes. Oh, oh. And then you have this other field of research that has produced a lot of products relating to organic farming. So, yung UP Los Baños Biotech, maraming products uh, on organic fertilizers, uh, and um, they're actually mga um, mycorrhizae, mga fungi, and bacteria, no? Nitrogen fixing bacteria, sa mga ganyan. So, Ang sabi nga ni Art sa akin kanina, yung ganyang technology to begin with, natural yan eh, nung wala pa tayong mga chemical fertilizers, ganyan talaga talaga yung, ganyan naman talaga yung farming natin. So maybe we can uh, tell our, ano, mga kababayan uh, more about our about projects. say something about that na, hindi naman uh -oh. pag, sinana, pag sinabi natin modern agriculture, hindi naman genetic engineering lang uh -oh, eh. Nga. So minsan dun sa traditional, marami tayong makukuha dyan. Ano, katulad nga noong ano, yung mga inoculants na yan. Ano? So, imbis na pure chemical fertilizer, nandiyan naman yung microorganisms. Eh. So, ipupurify mo na, ikukulture mo lang yun, i-enhance yung kanilang capacity to fix, uh, to make available the nutrients which uh, were not available, eh di makakatulong na yun. Ano? Plus yung mga native varieties natin na nagpapakita ng resistance sa mga climate change stress like like too much too much or too little of water, acidity, alkalinity. UV so, radiation. Oh, so, yun yung mga, actually, yun yung mga bagong nire-research uh, nire natin. Pero going back, ma'am, dun sa sinabi nyo tungkol dun sa uh, nag-aral dun yung mga Chinese. Oh. Tanda ko noon, powerhouse ang UPLB oh, no, sa soccer. Course. Kasi ang gagaling soccer. sa soccer ng mga Vietnamese, Thailand, China, abay, pag nagsama-sama yung mga yun, eh, talagang ang galing, 
Ang galing talaga ng, ay nangawala. <laughs> nangawala at sa iba na sila nag-aral. So, kumbaga, uh, nasa atin yung capacity. Kaya lang, medyo may kinulang tayong ibang important components. Kaya, uh, nandito, nandito tayo ngayon. Pero, uh, palagi ko sir, hindi naman tayo mag slide na siguro pataas na tayo. Hindi, hindi naman siguro. <laughs> Pero, yan ang lagi kong binibigay na ehemplo tungkol sa reversibility ng science and technology enterprise. Pwedeng umakyat, pero pagka binawi mo ang support, babalik yan ng, ano, mag-slide yan ng, ano, eh, yun, nakikita natin ngayon sa ibang bansa, merong mga political movements na i-reduce yung budget ng science, eh, natatakot na rin yung mga scientists kasi, talagang malaki ang magiging impact doon. Uh, maaaring nagkaroon tayo ng mga pagkakataong napabayaan ang agriculture uh, at hindi masyadong naalagaan ang science and technology part, research and development part ng agriculture. Eh, sa akin, eh, nakasalalay din yan sa mga tao na ating inaasahang magkaroon ng responsibilidad na maintindihan at maunawaan ang kahalagahan ng agrikultura at ang ating pamahalaan na magbigay ng sapat na suporta. Kaya hindi naman tayo nagkukulang palagay ko sa mga magkakaroon ng interes na magpatuloy ng uh, uh, research and development sa, sa agriculture. Um, so, I hope na magkaroon ng revival tayo, uh, hindi lang sa UPLB kung hindi sa iba pang mga universities natin sa bansa, sa mga state universities and colleges, na meron din naman silang kakayahan na mataas sa agrikultura. At sa iba pang mga aspeto ng agrikultura, gaya nga ng sabi ni Giselle kanina, yung sa uh, animal and uh, pult, uh, livestock and poultry and, and fisheries. Next time, pag-usapan. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ang dami nating ano, pwedeng pag-usapan tungkol sa agrikultura, pero sa ngayon, mukhang ang kailangan, eh, manawagan tayo sa ating mga kabataan na uh, mag-commit uh, to studying agriculture. Very, very attractive and sophisticated na ngayon ang Agriculture Biotechnology. Meron tayong kursong ganyan sa UP Los Baños, di ba? Na, na ano natin, na, na discuss natin yung water requirements, agriculture, yung irrigation. Na discuss din natin uh, yung uh, nutritional requirements from the soil, nitrogen. Siyempre, alam natin yung NPK yun, no? so yung phosphorus at yung... Uh, Potassium. Ano? Potassium, so meron rin chemical fertilizer dyan. Ako, chemist ako, naniniwala ako na a good combination of organic and chemical fertilizer is the right the right uh, uh, thing to pursue. Kasi ang dami namang mga uh, productive agricultural uh, countries dyan made use of chemical fertilizers, pero delivered in ano in the right amounts. Hindi yung uh, flooded with the chemical fertilizer na mag leach pa into the water. So, may ano yan, may paraan na gawin yan through technologies, yeah, diba? Precision farming, yeah. Precision, Precision farming. farming. Eh, ngayon na, climate change. You are the expert on climate change. Uh, Benj, anong sa tingin mo ang dapat natin gawin para sa mga uh, ating, ano, crops? Uh, kasi sa, ano, sa crops, temperature, uh, ano, uh, nag-iiba rin yung light. Well, nag-aaral ng konting botany, pero nag-iiba yung uh, responses ng mga, uh, ano, ano po sa rice, uh, kumukunti daw yung butin na napaproduce niya pag mataas yung nighttime temperatures. Yes. Oh my God. So, kapag adjust yung ating agricultural practices, at habang nag-develop tayo ng rice, na, na lalong magpaproduce na maraming butin. Maski mainit. Kahit mainit yung nighttime <laughs> temperatures. So, What about greenhouse? Pwede rin ba yun? Not for rice, but for, say, high-value crops. Uh, high-value crops. Okay, so, so, yes. light. Temperature, lahat yun. We have to use Hindi all pa. the tricks, <laughs> all the mechanisms. Hindi pa pwedeng isa lang kasi iba't iba rin ang ating mga sitwasyon sa bawat lugar dito yes, sa oh. Pilipinas. At gusto ko lang sana idagdag na ang problema ng agrikultura, hindi lang sa College of Agriculture na kasalalay. 
Gaya ng sinabi nga natin, meron tayong iniisip na precision agriculture. Marami po dyang engineering na kailangan. Kaya dapat eh, pag-ukulan din ng pansin ng iba pang mga disiplina. P physics nga sir, kasama din Kasama din ang physics. <laughs> At hindi lang yun, interdisciplinary talaga. Social scientist, yung ating legal system, yung yes. ating tinatawag na agrarian. Ano, uh, kaya, uh, kaya maganda nga yung programa natin dito okay. sa UP na yung EIDR. Interdisciplinary. Sapagkat yun ang talagang magbibigay ng ng substance to the approach kasi talagang medyo complex na yung mga problems ngayon. Hindi kaya ng isang tao. Hindi kaya ng isang <laughs> tao. Hindi kaya ng Hindi isang... Hindi kaya ng farmers. May agri-co-ops. Pero kung yung uh, nagpapatakbo ng co-ops na may equipment, eh hindi naman ano uh, well-trained. Paano gamitin yung mga equipment at paano i-manage yung mga farmers, hindi rin ano, uh, magre-result in ano, great productivity. Anyway, napakaganda ng ating talakayan ngayon at kulang na kulang ang oras. So, uh, sa susunod, tutuloy natin ang discussion at siguro sasama na natin dito yung iba pang aspects of agriculture. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo, mga kababayan na pinanood kami ngayon. Maraming maraming salamat sa ating dalawang distinguished guests experts in agriculture. Benj! Maraming salamat din sa mga nanood at mga, uh, sana yung may napulot kayo ng mga informasyon at kayo ay maging interesado sa agriculture lalo na papasok kayo sa negosyo nito na kailangan talaga natin sa kayo.